Okay, um, so we have been talking about dihybrid crosses and alleles and all that fun stuff, phenotypic and genotypic ratios. Um, so let's go back real quick, talk about um, probabilities. in genetics. Okay, so if we go back to, this is one of Mendel's hypotheses from the first section. Number four was the law of segregation that sperm and eggs only carry one allele for each character because they separate or segregate from each other during meiosis, right? So in this mouse, the chromosomes that it got from its mother, chromosome it got from its mother, was big C, big E, and the chromosome it inherited from its father was little c, little e. So when those segregate out, they're gonna make uh, gametes, either eggs or sperm, depending on if this is a male or a female mouse, that are either gonna be C, big C, big E, or they're gonna be little c, little e, okay? So it's an either or situation, sort of like flipping a coin, right? So the sperm, let's say, of this male mouse is either going to have this combination in it or this combination in it, okay? And the odds of the offspring getting that combination are essentially 50%, and the odds of that are essentially 50%, just like a coin, right? So here I've, I've changed it to a B rather than a C. So the odds of, and here's little b on the other side, the odds of the sperm carrying big B are what? The odds of, so if we say heads or tails basically, if I flip this, the odds of getting big B in that sperm are 50%. But there's only one other option now, right? It can't be big B in the other one, so it's got to be little b. That's also 50% of that. Here's another gene or another uh, character, big Y. And the opposite of that is little y. Okay, so again, there's a 50% chance of the sperm having big Y gene in it or little y gene in it. So we can use probabilities, and I talked about this a little bit um, in another lecture. What's the odds of, get rid of these two, of a sperm having big B and big Y? Same odds of it being big B or little y, or little b and little y. These are both 50% chance, right? So do you remember what the rule is for that? If you wanted to know the odds of getting big B and little y in one sperm, the odds are 50% for B, big B. Multiply that times 50% for big Y, so the odds of that particular combination are 25%. B, Y, okay. So you can use this when you calculate out the genetic probabilities of a certain combination. So if we, let's do, We've got a father who's got big B. I hope you can see those coins. And a mother. So this is dad. And this is mom. Who is also heterozygous for... Uh, the B gene, whatever that is. 
So the different combinations here in this Punnett square are big B, big B, big B, little B, big B, little B, or little B, little B. What are the odds of getting little B, little B? Well, it's the same thing here. It's one in four, right? Which is equal to one in four is equal to, look at that, 25%. So it's the odds of flipping this coin and getting a little b, and the odds of flipping this coin and getting a little b, and the odds are 25%. Okay. Same thing here. The odds of getting both big B and big B in that uh, particular offspring are 25%. Here we've got two, so it's going to be 50%, so that they, we just add those together. This rule here... called the rule of multiplication. You um, the odds of let's say um, one thing happening one thing happening So they say the odds of getting big B and the odds of a second thing happening happening. You multiply the odds of both of them together. Multiply the odds together. And so the probability of big B and big Y, you multiply it 50% times 50% and you get 25%. If we wanted to say, here's kind of the, the flip side, of, no, no pun intended, the flip side of this, what are the odds of me flipping this coin and getting heads or tails? Hopefully this is pretty straightforward or kind of a no-brainer. If I flip this coin, there's only two choices. It's either going to be heads or tails, right? So the probability of getting heads is 50%. The probability of getting tails is also 50%. So in order to get either heads or tails, you add them together, and the, the odds of getting one of those is 100%. So that's called the rule of addition. So a lot of these genetic principles, uh, the odds of having a blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby, you can kind of figure out the, the odds and chances based on this, um, this law of segregation. And by using the rule of multiplication or the rule of addition. Okay. New subject, or new area within this subject. Um, there's something called a test cross. And this is when you can mate an unknown genotype, uh, mating of an unknown genotype with a homozygous, homozygous recessive genotype. And that way you can figure out what the unknown genotype is. The unknown is carrying a recessive allele. Okay, so let's um, go back to our, our labs, Labrador Retriever 
not not laboratories lab labrador retrievers so we have a black lab and it's so this is its phenotype and its genotype remember big b is for black and little b is for chocolate so this particular black lab its genotype could either be big b big b or big b little b so we don't know right that's an unknown genotype what we're going to do is mate it with a chocolate lab and its genotype has to be big b little b right so let's say we do that mating there are two different possibilities let's say this is possibility a all the puppies are black Possibility B, half are black and half are chocolate. What is the unknown allele for that dog given possibility a. Anyone know? It means that the this parent is probably big B, big B. Meaning that all the puppies are either going to be, uh, all the puppies are, I'm sorry, are going to be big B, little B. I'll show you how that works real quick. So here's the unknown chocolate parent or black parent. We we don't know that one. This one we do know. Little b, little b. So all the puppies, if they're all black, means that this has to be big b, big b, and all the puppies are heterozygous. If Half of them are black and half of them are chocolate. Again, here's the one parent, the chocolate one, big B and the unknown. If we get any that are chocolate, that means that they have to be little B, little B, right? They have to be. That means that this has to be a little b. So we're going to have here a black lab, chocolate lab, chocolate lab, black lab. So half of them are black. And the other half are chocolate. Okay. So that's called a test cross, um, which is fine for figuring out the genotypes of, of pets. But if we wanted to find out the genotype of your sister <laughs> or your daughter, um, we can't just mate her with someone. That's, uh, you know, not cool. So instead of that, we can use what's known as a pedigree, which basically traces back through time the phenotypes to figure out the genotype. And it shows the inheritance of a 
trait through familial generations. Okay, so there is a, um, I guess the character would be the uh, sh shape or the uh, contour, I guess, of the, of the hairline. So you have some people um, who have a straight hairline. This is really awful. And you'll have other people who have more of a widow's peak hairline, right? This is a straight hairline and a widow's peak hairline. Um, so you can use, this is controlled by one gene. So we can um, figure out the genotypes of, of different people based on just what their phenotype is, whether they have a, pit, a widow's peak or a straight hairline. So, so this is used to determine or figure out the genotype of an individual. Um, and this is used not so much for figuring out the, <laughs> the genotype of someone based on their hairline, but you can use these principles to figure out the possibility of someone having a diseased baby based on the familial history, right? So it becomes kind of medically important, okay? Well, I'll show you how this is done, or I will attempt to. So the way that these are written or diagrammed is a female is assigned a, a, a round or a circle and the males are square okay and we're going to say if it's a hollow or a clear empty circle or square they have a widow's peak and if it's a solid circle or square they have a straight hairline And we're going to say that big H is the allele for a widow's peak. And little h is a straight hairline. So I think I'll have room here. So let's just start with uh, one generation and we'll have a, a male with the widow's peak. And he is married to a woman, female, with a widow's peak too. So what are their genotypes? We don't know yet. So we will say, well, if they have straight, then they have to have little h, little h, but if it's widow's peak, it could be either h, h, or h, big h, big h, and this the straight hairline has to be little h, little h, right? So let's just say we don't know for right now. And the wife also, big h, we don't know. And here's the other family that eventually we're gonna, we're, we're gonna have a mating down here. Spoiler alert. Here's a male with a straight hairline. Got a wife who has got a widow's peak. So again, her genotype, we don't know. His, we do, right? It's gotta be little h, little h. So let's say they have some children and they have a son who has a straight hairline, another son 
with a straight hairline and a daughter with a widow's peak. What's the genotype for these two gentlemen? We know if they have a straight hairline, they have to be H. H. So guess what? These little H's came from somewhere. Now we know where they came from. Dad has is heterozygous. And guess what? So is mom. Those little H's came from one from dad, one from mom. Okay. Here, this widow's peak daughter. I'm sorry. Uh, this is also a, a boy. It doesn't matter, really matter that much. Well, it will. Let me get over to this side. So this is a widow's peak son. Um, and we know that he has got to be, well, we don't know, I guess he could be H. Let's just say we don't know. Okay. Let's these two over here and they have two daughters. One's got straight hairline. So again, she has to have little H, little H. And guess what? That little H probably came from dad. That little H came from mom. Now we know that mom was heterozygous. They also had a daughter. Daughter. That's why this is important because these two are going to mate. And we know that her... So she's got a widow's peak. That means that she has at least one big H that she got from her... Um, mom, right? And dad can only give her little H's, so he or she has to be heterozygous. So now we want to figure out this one. Let's say they mate and they have two lovely daughters, one with a straight hairline, one with a widow's peak. So her genotype we know is little h, little h. She got one little h from mom. That means that dad is also heterozygous. This one, widow's peak, but we don't know what her second allele is unless she goes on to have offspring and we can follow the generation and after generation figure out, okay? So that's how a pedigree works is you can use detective and sleuthing to go back in time and look at familial traits to figure out the genotype of different people. Right? I'm sure you're wondering, am I going to have to do this in class? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> you just have to know how a pedigree kind of works and what it does. I'm not going to ask you to fill out one of these things or, or go back and sleuth your way to figure out whether someone's got attached or unattached earlobes. Another thing that's controlled by a single gene. Okay. So um, there are many traits that are controlled just by a single gene. Traits in humans are controlled... by a single gene, a single gene. Um, and just because an allele is dominant does not mean that it's gonna be more uh, common in a population. The dominant trait does not mean that it's gonna be normal in a population. say common in a population. Uh, the more common trait, I mean, we see more brown hair than we do red hair in a population, right? Uh, more dominant, not dominant, more common is what I meant. More common trait is known as the, a wild type. So brown hair would be a wild type. 
in humans. Um, so let's just show you, so let's show, make a little table here. Some dominant traits and recessive. Uh, just to show you, so freckles, having freckles is, is a dominant trait. No freckles is recessive, but it's more common to see people without freckles than it is with freckles, right? So here's an example of a recessive wild type. Flip that around. A dominant is is normal skin pigmentation, and the uh, there's a recessive uh, gene that causes albinism. So these are albinos, people who have. Um, I don't know if it's no pigment in their skin or very, very, very little, but you, you may have seen it there. Their skin is like pale white. They've got white hair. Their eyebrows are totally white blonde. Uh, so this is a recessive um, trait that's less common in a population because this is way more common. Um, there are a bunch of diseases, of course, that are... So let's... Just list a couple of these recessive disorders. We already talked about albinism. There's another one called cystic fibrosis. Uh, sickle cell anemia. Oops, not sickle. Sickle disease. Uh, here's a big word for you. Fennel. Ketonuria. This is a, also a shorthand, just called PKU. Um, it's a disorder where people have to really be be careful about eating the or consuming the amino acid phenylalanine. Um, and if you look at like the sign of a, a diet coke can, uh, if you look down just right at the bottom of the ingredients, it'll say phenylketonuric. Uh, you know, caution. Use caution. This this uh, drink contains phenylalanine. So it'll say PKU. Um, there are some more dominant, say disorders, I guess, syndromes. Uh, this includes dwarfism, dwarfism, uh, more sciency, not a con. Droplasia is the sciencey term for that, uh, and then one you may have heard of called Huntington's Huntington's disease. Okay, so real life medical issues. So let's just say here recessive disorders. If you're homozygous, recessive, you have the disease. Or the disorder. But if you're heterozygous, so this would be if you are, in this case we're saying little r, little r. A heterozygous person just carries the disorder, but may be what they, what they call asymptomatic. Does not have the disease. 
So they would be big R, little r in this case, what we're using for an example. So um, this is where uh, pedigrees and genetic testing can come in handy because if you're planning to have a child, uh, so if let's let's say we have uh, a mom and a bat, mom and a dad who are both heterozygous carriers for whatever this disease is. Here's dad's gametes; they're either going to be big R or little r. His sperm are going to carry either a big R or a little r, and then mom's eggs are also going to have either a big R or a little r in them. So what's the probability here? We get into that whole coin toss thing, right? What's the probability that these two are going to have a baby? with this disease, whatever that disease is. Can you, can you guess already? If you can, you're sitting pretty. So here's a one possibility. The baby is not diseased, right? Big R, little R. They're a carrier, but they're not diseased. Big R, little R. Carrier, but not diseased. Little R, little R. Diseased baby. What's, what are the probabilities of that? 25% chance that those two parents are going to have a baby with the disease, with that disease. Okay. And this could be albinism. It could be cystic fibrosis. It could be sickle cell anemia. It could be PKU. It could be any one of these things we were just talking about. Okay. So someone who is a carrier for PKU has a baby with someone who is also a carrier for PKU. That's a 25% chance that their baby is also gonna is going to have this disease, phenylketonuria. Um, so cystic fibrosis is the most common lethal genetic disease in the United States. Most common lethal genetic disease, genetic disease in the U.S. Uh, and what happens? You get this excessive mucus in the lungs and other organs, um, and it's carried. So heterozygous carriers by about one in 31 people in the United States. Uh, most common in the Caucasian population. So um, if you know that you're a carrier, you might not want to, uh, or you might want to reconsider, I don't know, having a baby with, excuse me, with someone who else is, is a carrier. Um, but it, this gets into like some questions about, you know, ethics and genetic technology technology so now we can do genetic testing to see if a parent is carrying uh, a disease um, we can also do let's say of parents we can do fetal testing We talked about uh, karyotyping. Uh, you take a small sample through an amniocentesis uh, while the mother is pregnant. You can figure out if that baby is going to have Down syndrome, or you might be able to take the do some genetic testing and figure out if they've got cystic fibrosis. Um, other technologies you can do like ultrasound to look for deformities. This is not genetic, but um, but the ethics part, basically, like, well, if you do testing as a baby and it you know turns out that you are now an adult and your data essentially 
confidentiality. Who knows, if they know that you're a carrier for some fatal disease, maybe an insurance company won't sell you an insurance policy. Uh, there are also things like financial concerns. Financial. Like, who pays for the testing? Um, do you pay for it, or does your insurance company? Uh, and then, what if you find out that you've got a disease? What uh, is done if, let's say, let's say bad news is discovered? <laughs> is discovered? through genetic testing. Uh, and then it gets into the whole question. I mean, th this is one of those things where, well, if you find out that you're having a baby that's got some sort of, you know, really horrible disease, do you abort the baby or do you keep it? And I mean, so these are things to, to think about. We're kind of going down this slippery slope, right? Uh, and then down the road, we get into this idea of like designer babies. Like, okay, I'd like to have a baby who's got blue eyes, bl uh, blue eyes, blonde hair, and it's going to be six foot four and no heart conditions. So you open that can of worms. We've got to think about it before we go there. Well, we've already gone there. All right, that's the end of uh, part one of the genetic inheritance chapter. There's another... Uh, set of lectures that will come after spring break. Ciao.